day after day after day. The hole in the ocean floor is hemorrhaging oil. At first, official estimates were just 1,000 barrels a day. For weeks, authorities insisted it was 5,000. Two months later, it has leapt to as much as 60,000. All we know is that the guesses keep growing. But even at this current estimate, enough oil has already escaped to cover every person in the United States in crude, 15 times over. On this edition of Fault Lines, we take a step back and look at the impact of four decades of oil and gas extraction on Louisiana's Gulf Coast. And we take a step forward into the lives of the people on the front lines. Our life's on stake, that's what it is. We've been doing this all our life, this is all we can do. the fragile ecosystem of the U.S. Gulf Coast. Home to fertile swamps and marshes and the most productive fishery in the United States. Also home to this. Nearly 4,000 active oil and gas platforms not to mention the country's largest concentration of refineries and petrochemical plants. In the wake of the Deepwater disaster, the threat posed by offshore drilling to the Gulf of Mexico is on display for the world to see. Less known is that the oil industry has been transforming this part of the world for decades. This oil is not coming ashore in a robust, thriving, a natural swamp or, or marsh. It is a marsh that is barely holding on and is falling apart. She did, yeah. She was the president of the Holy Cross. Aaron Viles shows us what he means. Uh, and, you know, this is her kind of vision, was to put... Just steps from the famous Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans is the Bayou Bienvenue. It was once a thriving cypress swamp that helped protect the city from flooding during storms. Today, it's a dead zone. So last time I was here, it was pretty much open water, I think. Yeah, what we need to see is more of the marsh grasses, you know, more of the canes, you know, more of that. Uh, After Hurricane Katrina, a small restoration project was launched here. But Aaron says the coast as a whole is facing an existential threat even greater than the oil washing ashore. I mean, the oil industry has been slowly killing the coast uh, of Louisiana for 40 plus years. You know, the oil industry has come in, they've dredged tens of thousands of miles of canals through the marsh to find oil, to lay pipelines, to get to their infrastructure. Uh, they've built refineries, they've built tank farms, uh, and that's all had a huge impact on the coastal wetlands of Louisiana. We head into the marsh to see for ourselves what's at stake in this disaster. It is a place teeming with life above and below the waterline. For decades, these marshes have hung on in the growing shadow of gas and oil infrastructure. Now, the crude reality of the oil itself has arrived. You know, like everyone else, I've been looking at pictures of oil on water for weeks now. But to be in such close proximity that I can touch it, in fact, it induces a, a kind of feeling of nausea not just that if there's oil here at this boom, then there's oil way into the, into the wetlands, very likely, but that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that the vast majority of the disaster is still way out in the Gulf, underwater, invisible, still to come. It's not easy to film underwater oil plumes 80 kilometers offshore. That's why this disaster has been defined visually by the oil washing up on land. But the hallmark of BP's strategy has been out on the open water, dumping more than four million liters of chemical dispersants on the oil, breaking it up into little globs that sink below the surface. The company and the U.S. Coast Guard 
argue that oil-eating microbe populations will expand to consume all the oil in the Gulf, that nature itself will clean up this accident. Eight p.m. on a Tuesday night, and a crowd has gathered at the local high school. What's going to happen is over the next few months, BP is going to be tested to make it right with you for what has happened. Representatives of BP and the Coast Guard are getting an earful from local fishing captains. And all we're getting from British Petroleum right now is we're going to make it right, we're going to do it right. Well, you know what? We don't want to hear this anymore. We're going to make it right. That's what you need to do. Thank you. Why are we still spraying this person that BP don't even allow in their own country? This is poisoning our waters. You're killing everything in the, in the waters. We've spoken before. I respectfully disagree with your viewpoint. Please let me finish. Okay. We say it's good to spray to this person. It's good, yes, to hide it. It's the height of shrimping season in coastal Louisiana. Any other year, all these boats would be out on the water. The silence of the marinas is poignant. A third of federal waters in the Gulf of Mexico are closed to fishing. Henry Hess and his deckhand are preparing for what may be their last shrimping trip. Henry was working for BP on the cleanup. A few days ago, he quit. They just don't know what they want to do, dude. There's a mad race out there. That one guy got 30 boats underneath his head or 40 boats, and he's lost too. He's just telling people do this, do that, and people running all over the place. So really, we ain't, we doing some good, but we fighting almost a losing battle right here. When describing the disaster response, BP and the U.S. government project resolve and confidence. Well, we're throwing everything we've got at this is the largest uh, oil spill response in the history of the country. And we've mounted the largest uh, response effort ever done in the world. But make no mistake, we will fight this spill with everything we've got for as long as it takes. But talk to people on the front lines of the crisis and you get a completely different story. They are fighting a forest fire with an eyedropper uh, and they're using the same technology they used 20 years ago in, Ex in Ex uh, with the Exxon Valdez spill. And it wasn't good then. For weeks, we've been trying to confirm an interview with BP to get its side of the story. We've been told that all the spokespeople are too busy with the effort to plug the well. We decided to try again in person, so we drove out to the Unified Command's Joint Information Center, the headquarters of BP and the U.S. government's public-private partnership in disaster response. How are you doing today? Good for you. We're, uh, we're press. We're here from Al Jazeera nope. English. No press to this gate. Who do you need to hear from in order to let us on to come in and talk to somebody? Uh, sir, turn that camera off now. BP put on a nice, beautiful show in the beginning of this, and that's all it ever was. Byron Encolade is president of the Louisiana Oysters Association. You got a southeast wind, a southeast wind, or a northeast wind, you wasting your beloved time. He represents an historic community of mostly African-American oyster men and women who have been fishing these waters for generations. Out on the Gulf, his anger starts to flow. You, 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 you're insulting people, and then you come down here and talking about food stamps and this, that, and other. Hell, give me BP money, and I'm going to tell those CEOs of BP, I'm going to give you some food stamps for you to live on until you clean up this mess. But Byron's frustration with the oil industry didn't begin when the Deepwater Horizon sank. Like many others on the coast, he sees this disaster as the latest episode in a long history of risky practices. No, it's your philosophy, it's the, the way you do business, and, and, and that's your problem. You know, you set these rules and then you want to violate them, and you expect us to go along with it, knowing that our families live here, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Our priorities remain the same, safety, people, and performance. BP's safety record seems to bear out this view. Recently released emails suggest that the company repeatedly chose cost-cutting over safety in the run-up to the deep water disaster. In the last three years, 
BP has been slapped with 760 safety violations that government regulators call egregious and willful. The other big oil companies combined received around a dozen. But BP is the Obama administration's partner in dealing with the disaster. And despite all the rhetoric, we will keep our boot on their neck until the job gets done. The corporation that caused the crisis continues to lead the response. The mighty U.S. government is reduced to scolding and pressuring BP rather than running the show itself. How did it come to this? Why is the U.S. government stuck in this oddly impotent role? Or in the words of a local fishing captain, where in heck has it ever come from in the United States that corporate levels dictate to the government what they're going to do and not going to do? Yeah, since the beginning of this thing called America, I would say. Monique Hardin is a lawyer at Advocates for Environmental Human Rights. We see how so much of our laws are shaped by the interests of industrial polluters, not just in our state, but in our nation. And BP being able to operate at such depths and the horrendous consequences of all of that were contemplated, were foreseeable, but it was of no moment for our lawmakers. From this point of view, the oil flooding the Gulf flows directly from three decades of deregulation under both Republicans and Democrats, a vision of a government that partners with corporations rather than polices them. Morning, everybody. This trend has clearly affected not only the capacity to respond to crisis, but the government's very idea of what it can do. To push BP out of the way would raise a question to replace them with what? But why would we allow a corporation, a, a drilling company, to have all the expertise? They bought all the engineers. They have all the equipment. So short of taking over BP and just running it, we can't do it. So it started with Ronald Reagan and it's you know, slowly and surely proceeded, the idea that we must have collaborative regulations and we shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be command and control, it should be people working together because the industry knows best and, you know, clearly that has bitten us in the ass right now. Call it the disaster that ideology built. With images like these filling TV screens, it's not easy to focus on the potential conflicts of interest that come from blurred lines between government and corporations. But consider the following. For years, the agency that oversees offshore oil has been receiving billions of dollars in revenue from the industry it regulates. Half of the federal judges in New Orleans have recused themselves from oil spill lawsuits because of their ties to the industry. And one of the co-chairs of Obama's commission into the disaster has had to take a leave from his position on the board of ConocoPhillips, a major oil company currently partnering with BP in the Gulf. Its biggest offshore find was explored by the Deepwater Horizon. It makes us, I was gonna say it makes us no better than third world, but it actually makes us worse. We so no better. And then we're going out and preaching against these other countries saying, oh, y'all are so bad. Really? because we're doing the same thing here, you know? For decades, it's been smooth sailing for the oil and gas industry in the rich waters where the Mississippi River meets the Gulf of Mexico. With this disaster, BP is facing massive costs and liabilities. And for the first time, talk of takeover and even bankruptcy is in the air. But for those who live here, what's at stake in this crisis can't be counted in dollars and cents. It's a relationship between the people and the Gulf. It's a question of identity. You know, for people who are not from here, when they hear the word shrimp, they might just think food. And what we think when we hear the word shrimp is culture, way of life, future, community. My grandpa did it, my uncles did it, now I'm gonna do it. I've been doing it for 50 years and I'm still gonna do it. Like I said, I just try, and it ain't doing no good. It's even hard to talk about it, tell you the truth.
I used to think that nothing could be worse than Hurricane Katrina. Boy, was I wrong. It was just five years ago, the last time the Gulf Coast of the United States commanded the attention of the world, as Hurricane Katrina laid waste to communities across the region. But the greatest human tragedy was the flooding of New Orleans. And that was not a natural disaster, but the result of policies, a levee system that failed, and the city's natural storm barriers weakened by decades of oil and gas development. Today, the crude gushing into the Gulf of Mexico is washing ashore onto an already fragile ecosystem and fragile communities just finding their feet five years after the great storm. Oh yeah, we lost everything we had, dude, everything. The only thing I didn't lose was my boat right there, and I'm lucky, because some of them that lost their boat, they still ain't working. They still trying to get the money because they didn't get the help to fix their boat. And now we're hit by this, which is really the kind of the inverse of Katrina. You know, the, the docks are there, the ice houses are there, the boats are still gonna be there, but they're not gonna have anything to catch. And they're not gonna have their fishing grounds anymore because they're, they'll have been, you know, contaminated with BP's crude oil. This disaster, so different from Katrina in so many ways, is nonetheless causing flashbacks here. Fishing people spend their days waiting in limbo, reduced to begging for relief from an ad hoc bureaucracy of outsiders. Outsiders who are running the disaster response. BP and federal officials making the decisions that will determine the future for local residents. It is all too familiar. Post Katrina, you closed our schools because you assumed we didn't know how to educate our children. You assumed we didn't know how to care for and reopen a hospital or house poor people. We just didn't have any money to do it. Post spill in the Gulf, you assumed those fishermen didn't know how to clean things up. You know, why didn't you ask them? Our communities, our families um, don't have a political voice. We don't wield economic power, and thus we're expendable. Just a few hours away from where the oil is washing ashore is a town that has come to symbolize the human cost of heavy industry in Louisiana. Mossville was founded more than two centuries ago by former slaves who created it as a refuge from racial violence, an historic community of African-American autonomy. For the folks in Mosul, especially if you speak to the elders, they'll tell you that, you know, we didn't know we were poor when we were growing up because our environment, our land provided so much. You can fish, you can hunt, you could farm, and you didn't go without, no one went without. And then in the 1950s, the petrochemical industry moved in. Just a few decades ago, a refinery was a primitive still making only kerosene. Today, some of these great plants employ thousands of people. Fourteen plants, including a major ConocoPhillips oil refinery. You see, Mossville is uh, circled by all of these plants, and we can't say that we have a choice to get away from those plants. We live here. We don't know when the chemicals are coming. We don't know what time to expect this, and uh, so we just have, have to live in it. I used to live here before the refinery was built. Hundred rabbits in the brush where those alkylation units are now. It's like we in a woman's womb of chemicals. But then the company moved in and set up this refinery. And we're dying in that womb because we're surrounded by so many industries that's polluting us. And so you Deborah Ramirez is the founder of Mossville Environmental Action Now. All these um, photographs. Uh, they are photographs of, of the, the families, yeah. of the families that was uh, in Mossville or still living in Mossville. A grassroots group pressing for compensation for what it insists are environmental crimes committed by industry. Couldn't move. He couldn't pick up his wings to fly because the oil had him. According to government tests, Mossville residents have three times the national average of dioxins in their blood dioxins associated with reproductive damage, cancer, and other diseases. And it's the same thing, this may happen to us. You know, and so it much remind, right. didn't it remind you of us? Because see, we were crippled like that. We were we in couldn't a community do. contaminated. Right. And we lost a lot. And like I say, not only family, 
friends that we lost. And we ain't gonna never get that back. All we have is memories. That's it. And now I'm gonna cry. Despite years of testing, government agencies have never accepted that there's a link between the plants and all the disease in Mossville. Conoco Phillips and the Environmental Protection Agency both declined our interview requests. And we were stopped as we tried to film the refinery. I will love Mossville with all my heart, with all my soul, and I will fight for Mossville until I can't fight anymore. People lose their lives in the fight, and that may be a lesson as well, so folks know now you know, we're going to lose some people in this, you know. The pump does not know when midnight comes. Days are the same to it. The story of Mossville is a reminder that the impacts of the oil and gas industry on the Gulf Coast did not begin on April 20th, 2010. The BP disaster may herald the final act for a way of life that depends on fertile marshes and a thriving gulf. But that way of life has also permitted the oil industry to have its way with this land for decades. The economy of coastal Louisiana rests on the three pillars of fishing, tourism, and oil. It would be the darkest irony of this disaster if the industry that devastated the other two turned out to be the only one left standing. It's almost like an abusive spouse relationship here. Oil and gas is killing not just the, the fish in the, in the water and the mammals, it's killing us up here on the land. We're, we're seeing that you know oil and fish and marine habitat don't mix. And it's no longer a situation where you, you have the luxury of trying to pretend that it, it can coexist. We want you to make <laughs> sure that you stop letting these people get their permits that easy without knowing the consequences behind it. That's what I say they ought to do, and they ought to put handcuffs on all of them. Stop calling me resilient. I'm not resilient, because every time you say, oh, they're resilient, that means you can do something else to me. I'm not resilient. The pump does not know when midnight comes. Days are the same to it. It pumps from Tuesday into Wednesday without a halt. Each day, every day, it brings us another 24 hours of progress. 